overwhelming majority of his life, it was just an act. Donald Trump's domineering tough guy routine. It was a shtick he perpetrated to synthetically inflate his reputation as a strong-armed businessman. Then the Republican Party cast him as its idol, and the fantasy turned into reality. Trump's grip over the GOP in Washington isn't new, of course. But this week, more than any other in recent memory, proved that it is tighter than ever. He inspired self-sabotage in bipartisan congressional border negotiations. He effectively got the RNC chair to resign because he wanted changes there. And his picks for vice president are now practically tripping over themselves, cosplaying what they would have done for Trump on January 6th. That evolution is the subject of a new piece in The Atlantic. Former Trump advisor Sam Nunberg told McKay Coppins in the business world and in the entertainment world, he didn't think Trump was able to intimidate people as much as he does now. Quote, I just remembered that there'd be a lot of stuff that didn't go his way, but he has all these senators in the fetal position. They do whatever he wants. Joining our conversation, staff writer for The Atlantic, McKay Coppins, whose byline is on that piece. David is back with us as well. McKay, let me make sure I'm getting this right. Donald Trump sort of always wanted to have this influence in the business world. He created this whole persona. It did not have the same impact there that it has had in the political world. My question is, is why? What happened? What changed? That's what I was fascinated to think about as I was writing this piece. Um, you know, I think it helps to understand where the Republican Party was circa the summer of 2015 when Donald Trump entered his first presidential campaign. By 2015, the Republican Party had been through years of infighting and growing ideological co incoherence and an increasingly wide gap between the base of the party and the political class of the party. You remember in 2010, 12, 14, you had all these establishment Republicans who, uh, you know, had pretty conservative records. They thought they were doing all the right things and they were getting toppled in primaries by uh, these, these kind of Tea Party upstarts. And it, it became clear that a lot of elected Republicans had no idea what their voters wanted, and they were scared of their base, right? Then you have Donald Trump come on the scene, and he starts immediately acting like an old-school party boss, right? He's this guy who is telling people what to do. He's saying, if you cross me, I'll end your career, but if you're nice to me, I'll keep you in, in the party and the good graces. And I think for a lot of Republicans in Congress and elected Republicans across the country, it was kind of almost felt like a relief, right? They, they suddenly saw that the formula for re-election was really simple. Do whatever Donald Trump says. It doesn't matter if his orders are incoherent. It doesn't matter if they're reckless, if they're self-sabotaging. As long as I look like I am obeying Donald Trump, the voters won't punish me. I'll be able to keep winning primaries. And I think that's why you continue to see events play out like you saw this week. Well, and, and David, what's amazing to me is, is the fact that they don't seem to have caught on to this yet. So on Trump's options for vice president, you started the week with uh, J.D. Vance, how he would have gone about January 6th differently than Mike Pence. And now you have Elise Stefanik. Take a listen. I would not have done what Mike Pence did. I don't think that was the right approach. I specifically uh, stand by what I said on the House floor, and uh, I stand by my statement, which was there so was unconstitutional the overreach. Votes. There was unconstitutional constitutional overreach in states like Pennsylvania. And uh, I think it's very important that we continue to stand up for the Constitution and have legal and secure elections, which we did not have in 2020. And m the tens of millions of Americans agree with me. David, I'm old enough to remember on January 6th when Elise Stefanik condemned what happened. She now seems to be locked in some type of reality contest for America's next top vice presidential pick. It, it, it's it's just so it's so sad because there are people who are listening to her and there are people who are are believing her whitewashing of history. Yeah, Alicia, an absurd and disgusting sellout moment from Elise Stefanik and one that should offend uh, traditional patriotism and offend the constitutional convictions of most Americans. And the worst part is she knows it. She knows it. I, I am most taken by Elise's evolution on this. In, in the grandeur with which she has done it. You know, it used to be when Donald Trump came in and kind of crushed the traditional orthodoxy of the party, rebuilt it in his image, demanded loyalty, 
you had all the Republicans fall in line, and then the outlier was Lindsey Graham, the person who very publicly did a face plant, kind of made a fool of himself, humiliated himself to stick himself right up to Donald Trump. Lalise has shot way past Lindsey Graham, has reset the entire barometer for what it means to completely abandon your convictions and show your loyalty to Donald Trump for your own personal political interests. It is a tough moment to watch Elise Stefanik do that, but she did it and she owns it. I think that the broader question uh, that I wrestle with, Alicia, is we are now eight to nine years into the rise of Donald Trump and his taking control of the party. If you are a never-Trumper today in the Republican Party, why are you staying? Who are you fooling? Yourself or the American people? Because this is, there is not an internal tension any longer between Donald Trump and Republicanism. Donald Trump is Republicanism. Republicanism is Donald Trump. If you are a never-Trumper in the Republican Party, it is time to leave. What are you waiting for? There, there is a detail in your reporting, McKay, that almost to me shows how Maybe somehow th this could have all been different. We quoted former Trump advisor Sam Nunberg earlier on the topic of pre-politics Donald Trump. Here, here's some more. I, I loved this exchange. He pointed to, um, you know, he pointed to Trump's salary negotiations with NBC during Trump's apprentice years. Jeff Zucker, who ran the network at the time, has said that Trump once came to him demanding a raise. At the time, Trump was making $40,000 an episode, but he wanted to make as much as the entire cast of Friends combined, $6 million an episode. Zucker countered with $60,000. When Trump balked, Zucker said he'd find someone else to host the show. The next day, according to Zucker, Trump's lawyer called to accept the $60,000. A spokesperson for the Trump campaign did not respond to a request for comment. McKay, what struck me about that was just that someone told him no. They told yes. him no. They yeah. called his bluff. And that is the piece that we have not seen play out on the political side. It's such an important point. You know, we, we're now so far into the Trump era that we've all sort of accepted this reality that Trump has all this power in the Republican Party and he can, uh, you know, he can end whoever's career he wants. And of course, they're going to do what he says. But again, when he the Republicans gave him this power, they handed it to him. Right. You know, uh, another thing that I, I've heard Sam Nunberg talk about is that in 2016, uh, when when Trump first started running, actually in 2015, when Trump made that comment about John McCain's, uh, what, you know, how he, he was a war hero only because he'd been caught and kind of uh, insulted his war record. Um, you know, at the time, that was a that was an early test of Trump's staying power, his 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 ability to say whatever he wanted and continue to stay atop the Republican Party. Privately, Trump was very concerned about that. He he actually was fretting to Sam Nunberg and other advisors, saying, "Should I apologize? You know, people on TV are saying that I went too far. Should I apologize?" And his advisors told him, "No, stick it out and and just ride this out, and Republicans will fall back in line." And they did. What if they just had? It? What if those Republicans had not fallen back in line and said, "This is disgusting. You need to apologize or or leave this primary and drop out." My bet is that Trump would have done it. He would have done what they said. The strength is, it, it, it's its an act. The bravado is an act. And it, throughout his business career, his media career, the people at the other end of the negotiating table saw that. They, they For some reason, Republican politicians, congressional Republicans, they, they're just too afraid. They're too timid. They, they gave him this power over their party, and, and they've never been able to get it back, and now they're not even trying.